briefly going to go over where the current market is for natural gas and electricity. I'm going to talk about some of the impacts the ISO policies are having moving forward. And I'm going to give some brief overview of the future. And to give a little background on me before we get a little further into it, I was born and raised on a farm in Teeswater, a dairy farm, and um, went to the University of Guelph. And I don't know why. What's that? What's that? Step forward. Step forward. Sorry, I can yell. Can everybody hear me? So I was born and raised on a dairy farm in Teeswater and um, went to the University of Guelph, so I do have an ag background. So at one point in my, my career, I decided to morph over to the energy business. So um, I found it very rewarding and much like agriculture is, there's always things that are changing in the energy field. In the regards to where the current market is for, for, for gas and electricity, this is where gas is right now. One of the positives about, about looking at things like CHP and looking at um, you know whether it's GA mitigation is that we are actually enjoying some pretty stable natural gas prices and the fact that when you are looking at, at you know the cost of operating I can agree with what John said it is very possible to produce power at those types of numbers and the real reason is because we have fairly stable gas we have as much gas now in North America as we've ever had and that's really because of shale because the shale market we, we've got more gas than we we've ever had um, and looking at the prices as it said if you look over here you know in the last 78 years we've basically been operating between two and six dollars a GJ and um, even with the high price area of LNG um, I mean, we've got so much gas that that has very little, doesn't really have a lot of impact on, on the North American side. Um, as far as where pricing is, um, we're again, you know, if you look at 9th, November 18, we're at probably all time lows. Some of why ACO is low is, is there's some, some different reasons for that, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that we've had a transition away from Alberta to, to the east. We've had a lot of eastern gas come into play now in, in Marcellus and, and Pennsylvania. Um, that's allowed, if you live in Ontario, you're in a really unique position because there is more gas flows through Ontario than any other point in North America. So it gives you guys a real opportunity to, when you're looking at power generation, you've got a real opportunity, as long as you can get the gas, to produce power at a very economical rate for a number of years. Um, one question that was asked earlier is why have we not seen a lot of CHP in, in the market? And the, really the reason for that is we haven't had electricity prices until about five years ago that really warranted us looking at other options outside of LDCs. Before, before five years ago, GA costs weren't 10 cents a, a kilowatt hour. They were much more reasonable. In fact, if you go back to 2005, there was a point where the government was actually paying you a credit for, for global adjustment because they were able to sell the power to the states and create a profit. So we've gone from that to the point now where John mentioned before where the power, the GA costs now are over 12 billion billion dollars a year and um, you're paying 10 cents a kilowatt hour. And as a result we're now looking at situations where it makes a lot more sense to put in CHP to figure out if you can, if you're a class A user, if you want to uh, mitigate and we even see a lot of hybrid situations where some of the volume is done as a, as a CHP and some of the volume is done as peat shaving. So there is combinations that you can do as well. Um, the ACO price right now to fix is about $1.80. If you convert that, it's I think about eight cents, isn't it, Ange? Does that convert to about eight cents? A cubic meter? Yeah. That's Alberta price. That's Alberta price. You still have to add transport in that. Um, Spot market is about a buck forty. I checked this morning, so that gives you an idea of where the market is. Really, really a lot lower than what we've we've experienced in a long time. Um, storage, storage um, is a is a something we watch very carefully. Um, if storage gets too low, it tends to put a lot of pressure on the on the market. But as I said, we we were enjoying a pretty pretty robust storage over the last few years. Um, the storage in green here is 2018. It's a little bit, 
of a misnomer because there's some issues in the ACO pipeline that are causing it, uh, uh, issues with ACO trying to inject gas into storage. Um, I'll get into them in a minute. But at the end of the day, as long as we, we are you know, we're able to keep storage levels up, that keeps gas prices down. Um, where you will see spikes in the market on the short term market are usually two or three things that cause that. Number one is if storage levels get too low. Number two is if we get a really cold winter, that'll tend to do things like that. And number three is it would be, you know, high demand. And I'll get into a minute as far as why our demand isn't as high as it used to be. Um, electricity. As you can see, the little red line is basically the average cost of electricity in Ontario, the supply part. The green line is a combination of the what we now call the black line. The black line is global adjustment costs. So as everyone can see, we've seen a pretty uh, gradual increase in global adjustment and we've seen uh, pretty much a flatlining of, of HOEP prices. And HOEP is the actual cost of the electricity. Um, as you can see, um, it makes it difficult for someone to hedge electricity in the Ontario market because really the only part that they can, oh sorry, the only part we can actually hedge is this stuff. This stuff is, where is basically determined through, you know, whatever the government has determined is their loss on the market. So if you are someone who wanting to control your electricity prices, that's pretty hard to do unless you take control of it yourself. And that's where things like CHP and things like GA mitigation become almost vital in order to make your profit, maintain profitability. Um, you know, this here, this black line here and this combined, in certain LDCs, I heard John say 13, 14 cents. We have clients that are paying 22 cents. And we're talking about clients that are not on the small side. We're not talking residential, I'm talking large scale clients. Clients using 10 million kilowatts. So it is a very, it's, you know, back here in the 14 and 15, we were seeing prior prices here, eight cents, and it wasn't that big a deal. And no one was looking at CHP at that time because the numbers didn't work. But when we're up here, now the numbers work. And that's the big reason people are now looking at CHP, looking at CO2, looking at us, you know, lean burn engines. Lean burn engines, just to give you guys a comparison, sorry, Alan? Well, just more, um, that's not including any distribution. No, no, this is just actually the GA and supply price. So how much approximate is distribution? Well, it depends on the LDC. So like if you're in Hydro One's territory, you probably would add eight to nine cents to that. If you were in say, uh, Electra, Toronto Hydro, it's probably more like five cents. So it depends on where you are. But again, uh, more rural areas tend to have higher, where greenhouses are unfortunately, tend to have higher, higher distribution and transmission costs. Um, fortunately with CHP and stuff, this piece you can control. And that's the key point to this, is this is the piece of the puzzle that we, can have, we have control over. I shouldn't circle it like that, sorry guys. <laughs> so um, this is the part I focus on when I'm working with a client, is how do I get rid of this? Because I believe I can get rid of it. Um, or at least take control of it. So if a client's budgeting for the next 10 years, there shouldn't be any problem with us coming up with a pretty consistent electricity price for the next 10 years. <coughs> Challenges with this when you're growing a business or expanding, obviously connection costs do play a big role in that. I have seen $20 million on the connection side for, for electricity for clients who wanted to expand. I've seen on the gas side, <coughs> you know, a million and a half dollars I've seen. So those are things that we definitely have to weigh when we're looking at the budget and the economics of a project. Those are the type of things that will make me decide whether a client should look at the CHP or maybe GA mitigation. Um, because how much fuel he need, he's gonna use or what type of fuel definitely plays a role in that discussion. Um, as I mentioned with storage, here's some of the reasons ACO is actually at a pretty big discount to NYMEX right now. So ACO being the Alberta delivery point for gas, NYMEX obviously being New York Stock Exchange. Um, right now there's a lot of problems within Alberta as far as uh, they're having a lot of issues on the pipeline maintaining pressure. So it's giving them a lot of uh, issues as far as injecting into the, into the uh, system 
So it's creating, that's why one of the reasons storage is a little bit lower than it would normally be. This is causing a lot of uncertainty. I'm sure everybody's heard about the issues with uh, Keystone and the pipelines and all that. Um, we're just not sure when that's all gonna hit the market. And then because of this, the issues with pressure, gas that normally would be going to Ontario by now is being let, is trapped in Alberta. So it has created a bit of a opportunity for clients who are looking to budget. Um, if you lock it in at ACO, there's actually some, some opportunities to do that at a, at a pretty attractive price. Um, I'm going to get into what, what, what EC&G does on the electricity side. So back in 2011, we had a lot of clients coming to us that were what we call the 5 megawatt client. And, and basically that's when Class A first was born, if anybody's unaware. Class A, as, as you know, is clients that are operating 5 megawatts. Um, if you wanted 5 megawatts, if you are non-agriculture or non-manufacturing, that is the category that you can operate Class A in. If you are agriculture, which is the, or the greenhouse space here, uh, which is the 111 on the tax code, you can drop to 500. And manufacturing of 31, 32, or 33 again as well. So back in 2011, when we were really looking at how to help clients on the electricity side, we came to the conclusion that hedging gas was probably not the best way for us to, to add value to our clients. So we started looking at running a GA alert service to help them mitigate in the, obviously, the five magic hours that, that people, uh, people have come to know as the Class A hours for the year. Does, does everybody know what I mean by Class A? Is there anybody who doesn't know what I mean by Class A? So Class A is, if you're at home or a residential person, you get billed your global adjustment on every kilowatt hour. The way larger users get billed is the five highest hours in the year that, that Ontario runs as far as peak load. Whatever you produced as a producer in those five hours, as far as peak demand, you are basically you take your, let's say it was five megawatts, your peak demand in those five hours, and the Ontario average was 21,000. They divide your five megawatts into the 21,000, and you come up with what percentage of the total GA cost is yours to pay for the next year and you basically it's an historical thing so from may of first of uh, so let's say for this year it was may 1st 2017 to april 30th 2018 that set the pricing for the next year for you so the way that works is if i can actually run a generator in those and hit those five peaks and john was talking before about how how if you miss two of those peaks it was a costly thing and I'll get into the minute what that cost looked like. But if I can hit all five peaks and I'm running a generator for those five hours, I essentially can make GA go away, it becomes zero. For a client that's above 500 if you're in the greenhouse space or, or manufacturing. So that's one of the things we actively do with clients. We have about 135 clients that use our service right now and, and that's what we do for them. We, we basically monitor when we think those peaks are going to turn, occur, and we tell them to turn a generator on uh, to mitigate against that. So we also have, other, and then we have other clients as far as the, the CHP. Well, that's not as big a concern because they're running generally 8,000 hours a year or 6,000 hours a year, and they're always running at peak times. So they're already doing the mitigation by themselves. So. Um, as far as if you are not class A, obviously you're class B. Most people that are running CHP would tend to be a class B, would stay on class B. You have the option to be, you, you always have the option, you don't have to be a class A user, you can choose either whether to be class B or class A. And it really comes down to the financial analysis. We run that on a regular basis for a client and we determine which is the better fit for them. And that also determines what strategy we want to run for that client. So in the case of greenhouses though, because they can use all the heat, that free heat that Mr. Douglas was going to give you, um, it becomes very attractive to run uh, combined heat and power. And my motto for, for whether it's justifiable to do that, that business is, has generally been, if you have to be able to run 6,000 hours. That's always been my magic misnomer on combined heat and power. <coughs> Well, that is starting to change, and I will readily admit, as power prices are going higher, 
you know, using how much heat you use is becoming less and less uh, of, of a priority. But it is a big benefit if you can use the heat. No question, it saves you a significant dollars. Um, typically, when you're looking at uh, cogen, uh, rich burn engines will burn about 15 to 25 percent more gas than a lean burn. So that gets into discussion if you're going to use a lot of gas. Um, using uh, lean burn makes a lot more sense to me and using putting an SCR on to control the emissions that all fits that picture in my mind. Um, as I said for one megawatt for half megawatt for the other part of the puzzle for for greenhouse guys has been the fair hydro act or plan it's also been named as. Um, back in 2017 our then premier uh, premier win was getting all kinds of pressure from from small businesses and residential groups to to lower hydro costs and she came out with the great idea that she was going to lower high electricity bills by 25 percent for for small business and for for farms um, at the end of the day it's certainly a short-term benefit for for clients because greenhouse do fit in the agricultural space so they do qualify for this. Um, the downside is, and the plus to what we've been talking about here today is, is that it's probably gonna drive electricity prices a lot higher four years from now when this is over. And the only way around that is if the government was to choose to bury that in your tax bill instead. That's the part we don't know what they're gonna do. But at the end of the day, the best way I can describe what this is gonna cost to consumers is it was a $1 billion hit when the Liberals decided to uh, forego the gas plant in uh, Mississauga, this will be that times 20. The, uh, the interest hit on this program is gonna cost taxpayers well over $20 billion. And that number seems to be growing as well. The end result is when this program comes up in 2021, we're gonna see a lot higher electricity prices, that's my belief. Um, in the meantime, you know, basically what you're looking at is, as far as the savings, if you're in the cannabis space, if you do operate this, is about four cents. But again, even with that, if you look at the cost of power, uh, producing your own power still is, is cheaper than, than layering in this four cents, really, at the end of the day. Um, <clears throat> what else could I say about this? Nah, that's, a, that's all I'm gonna focus on that. Um, so what we've seen over the years, and I'll get into this, is we have generally in Ontario seen a decline in peak demand for the last, the last 10 years, a dramatic decline. And there's three reasons that's occurred. The first is we've had a mass exodus of manufacturing from the, from the, uh, from the Ontario market. And that has dropped our, our peak demand significantly. The second is the programs like Class A, like um, the Save on Energy program, have significantly drove consumers to flatten the peaks in Ontario. They've drove, drove clients to do things that, you know, have been good for reducing electricity more efficiently. And the third thing that's really played into that is obviously weather. Weather plays a huge role. The cooler summers, we use less power, and we have tended to, to have um, advantageously um, the weather has worked in our favor for most of the last little while for, for, for a power point of view. So what that also means though, if you are uh, like a GA mitigator, it is going to make it more challenging for you to hit those peaks. Because what we've also seen as the interior market is the curve has began to flatten. And that means that rather than having only 20 days that you may run a generator or run batteries, um, you're going to, you're probably gonna be getting closer to 40 or 50 days potentially. The other problem with, and this is why I favor generators over batteries, and I'm sure Tyler is gonna like me saying this, um, is that the duration these, that you're gonna to need to mitigate is going to become longer. It is rather than you know, operating a four hour window where we might be able to identify the peak, we're now seeing situations where you know, the peak for all of Ontario is 22, 23,000 megawatts. Well, there could be a four hour stretch where there's a 10, 10 megawatt stret, a, a split. So if you're a battery guy and you have one hour charge of battery or two hours at the most, the question is which hour do you pick? 
And there has been cases where, you know, if you had two hours of charge, because that's typically what a battery scenario has, is about two hours, um, there's a real chance you could miss. And what that means for you is if you miss one of those peaks, it's $100,000 per megawatt for every hour you miss. So if you have five, five in a year, your potential savings per megawatt is half a million dollars on GA. So for every peak you miss, it's gonna cost you 100 grand right now. So it's a big deal to miss one. Um, with generators, my personal opinion is, you shouldn't miss because every time it's even thinking about um, a, a GA day, you turn it on. It's pretty simple. Um, you don't have to worry about hitting a certain hour in a day. If you think that's a, a day where you could have a GA day, in the morning you start your engine. You just you don't worry about it. Start your engine and you're good to go for the day. Um, so that's why I'm a bigger believer in generators for, for mitigation than I am them on the um, thing. The other side to that though is, as we talked about, if you're running 50 days a year, well now all of a sudden you're saying to yourself, well if I'm already going to run this thing 50 days a year, why don't I run it a lot more days? So that gets into the economics again, you know, where it does make sense to put in like a CHP or something like that. Because if you're going to run this thing that much anyways, it does make some sense if you're going to utilize the heat especially, um, the cost, the numbers work for doing that. Um, as far as peaks in Ontario, we've seen a pretty, also a shift on when they occur. So in 2017, for example, um, we had three of the five days that actually occurred in the summer. For the first time ever, we had peaks in the fall. So, and this is a big, big factor in the fact that we have seen a lot less industrial in the Ontario market. So now it's no longer that our peaks are used to be set by the industrial market. So if you were a hot day where all the, all the manufacturers were operating, there was no chance you were ever going to see a weekend peak or a fall peak. They were all going to happen in the summer. But now because our industrial base has dwindled so much and we're more residential slash, we, you know, it's more affected by that, it's just as, there's just as much potential to have a peak in the fall, which actually happened again this year. And there's also potential to have one on a weekend, which was absolutely unheard of. There was no way 10 years ago this would have ever happened where a peak, one of the top five peak days in Ontario during the year would have occurred in a weekend. In 2017, we had a number six where the, one of the weekend days was actually sixth highest in the, in, in the uh, system. So that's how close it came to be in one of the top peaks. So the moral of that is peaks are flattening, which again, if you're a base load, if you're a base load type scenario to a uh, public energy support point, I mean, there, it does make this an easier scenario to run a, a system all the time. Um, as I said, they're flattening. The hours that you have to run an engine have become more if you want to manage your peak. Um, and curtailment has become a lot harder. So we had clients in our system since 2011 were trying to do this internally, where they would shut things off and they would you know, shut off this, shut off that. If you're a greenhouse guy, you might shut your lights off you know, to, meet, to shave the peak. And it's got to the point now where it's become a very difficult thing to do because it's just the number of hours you have to do it have become that much more. So I come back to this, worst case scenario is an every day is a peak day. And that comes back to the discussion about, well then we should be running an engine a lot more hours. So if every day is basically becoming a peak day, what I mean by that is our curve has become so flat that it's almost a baseline now, rather than just you see this type of scenario, it makes justifying running an engine a lot more, making makes more sense. Um, Oh, I, I hit the button the wrong way. Sorry, guys. So this is what a graph looks like. So you'll see back in back oh, back in 2010, this was the highest peak uh, in Ontario. The average peak in Ontario for the year was about 20. The top peak was about 25,000. This is the top five. You'll see here 014, and this is what you'll see a lot of. This was the cold, one of the cold coldest summers on record. And obviously 2007 was one of the coldest summers on record. 2018 was right about here. That's about where the top ended up, 22,000. Um, so we saw the industrial market, as I said, this was really impact of the industrial market leaving Ontario. 
This here was more related to cold weather. Now we're seeing this decline. This is a lot, these last years here, this keeping down the stairs, this has a lot to do with the, uh, with the Class A program, with clients becoming far more efficient. The key thing I want to mention about this, this is not just Ontario. This is North American. Um, I've talked to several people in the States. This is the same pattern in the U.S. So we're not seeing just this in Ontario. We're seeing this North American wide. So what that means is, is that as people become in North America more efficient, there will be more gas available because keep in mind that in the U.S. a large part of their electricity generation is generated from gas-powered systems. So that makes gas uh, also a nice attractive thought as far as keeping the price of it down is because it'll be more available to utilize towards those sort of opportunities. Um, so as I said, we launched our program because we realized back in 2011 that we were going to help the electricity side of our business. I mean, being just a, a person to sell electricity to a client just, yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Being a person who just sell electricity to a client, we weren't really helping them anymore. So we got, the, we got more involved with our clients on the conservation side. And it started out with this program. We morphed that into helping a lot of clients with their light, lighting retrofits. Back in 2014 when the government announced their CHP program, we ended up putting in about 158 applications on, on CHP, which we turned into about 40 projects on CHP that we ended up uh, going forward with with clients. On the mitigation side, like I said right now, we have about 130 clients that are looking at installing generators and are looking seriously at it. And some of them are looking at it from this perspective of, of running them all the time. Some of them are looking at it from the perspective of running them um, as a class A. But at the end of the day, they're all shooting for either eight cent, nine cent power, which you can achieve with a, with a, with a CHP, or they're looking to get rid of this part of their hydro bill. So to give you perspective, the GA on your hydro bill is somewhere between 60 and 70% of your cost. So getting it rid of it alone will cut your hydro bill by 60 to 70%. From there, you have to decide if you're, if you're paying eight cents to the utility for, for connection costs and you're paying still a fairly significant demand charge over and above that for other, for, for other things, then that's where you start asking yourself, where's the economics? Are the economics on running this thing all the time or are the economics on running this 500 hours? That's always, that's, that's where we come in. We may help the client make those decisions. Some of those decisions are based on whether we can get gas. If we have a client where you just can't get the gas because there is no gas available, that means maybe we have to run that engine on diesel, propane, compressed natural gas. It makes it a lot harder to run a CHP system. So some of that is predicated on us knowing what we can get for a fuel source. And that actually, when we're looking at, at a, a site to develop on what we're going to do with it, that is actually becoming one of the more dri driving impacts is what's the cost of getting natural gas to that site. If they have to reinforce the line or they have to upgrade it, fine. If we get a number, we can usually work with it. But if we can't even get gas, that, that, that changes what we have to do at this site. So what's the future look like? Um, the one thing that does we are tracking a lot of, and I'm sure a lot of people have heard, is cap and trade. And my answer in cap and trade is where is it's heading? The answer is no one really knows at this point. What we know is the government of Ontario got rid of their cap and trade program that the Liberals have put in. It was revoked. As of right now, what, what's being proposed by the federal side is if the provincials have not come up with an alternative, they will implement that effective April 1st, their program. Um, what that would mean to most people in the greenhouse space is you would probably fall into what they call the carbon levy category. This here is meant for anybody using over 10,000, anybody who has a 10,000 carbon base to 50,000 and above fits into this space. Most carbon, guy, most greenhouses won't fit into this space. Um, what it means from you on the percentual side of this side, I know this probably doesn't mean anything and this doesn't mean, but basically what the calculation works back to on a cubic meter is in 2019, we're probably looking at about a four cent a cubic meter levy 
And in 2020, probably somewhere around six. In 2021, probably about eight. That's kind of the numbers that are being thrown around. My own personal guess is that the provincial government will come out with something different. So we, and we don't know what that looks like yet. So it's a bit of a guess, um, but from the standpoint of, of how it impacts you on the gas side, you also have to keep in mind that the electricity side is also driven by a lot by natural gas generation. So some of it will be offset on the electricity side by electricity also increasing. So it's basically a two-edged sword when you really look at it. If, if gas sets the price on the, like, on the electricity side, then it's, the two are going to somewhat weigh each other off a little bit. Um, on power, um, as far as supply goes, you remember I, on that chart I said it stayed fairly flat, the supply piece? We don't see that changing. That doesn't mean I don't think power is going up. I think it is going up. But it's not the supply part that's going to drive it because we really do have we have over 36,000 megawatt capacity for electricity in Ontario. We have lots of power. The problem is that we've gotten ourselves into situations with, for example, financing Bruce Nuclear refurbishment and doing a lot of things that they're added cost to the market that really have created the loss on the GA side. So from my perspective, the increase in power is going to come from the global adjustment side. And from also, as these utilities become get more pressure to become more efficient, I also believe transmission costs and that are also going to rise. So there is going to be increases on power that pro programs like like running engines all the time and things like that are definitely going to have more, more play and more reasoning just that. So even today at 13, 14 cents, it's not conce inconceivable to see power prices get over the eight, up to 18, 19 cents. Keep in mind, some of that 13, 14 cents is driven off the fact that the fair hydro rates been in, is in play right now and has kept those prices down. Once that leaves, no one really knows what the impact the market's gonna be in a couple of years, how much of a jump we're gonna see. Everybody agrees there's gonna be a jump, we just don't know where it's gonna be. As far as gas prices, like I said, they've been like to hedge gas long-term, um, we have clients, especially in, in, our, in our, some of our um, mush sector group, which is municipal hospitals, they have looked at 10-year gas. A lot of the programs for hedging gas for, for situations like where you have a power purchase, we can get 10-year gas. Doesn't necessarily mean we would recommend you do that because as anything else, it's like an interest rate on mortgage. As you the further out you go, the higher the risk that's put into it. But five-year gas, seven-year gas is definitely things that we're seeing clients do when they have this type of program in place. And, and what we would do in that case is, as, we add, as that 10th year hits, we always continually add years into the model to keep the help with the hedging of that as well. Um, you'll see things like Dawn here. Dawn is actually an Ontario delivery point. So one of the other factors that has become a big discussion is the transport piece. And on the gas side, this is also a piece that um, a lot of clients um, need to manage. Um, there's certain rates that Yenbridge has, Union Gas has for, for transport, and there's certain categories you want to help be in if you're using a certain amount of gas. So especially when you're increasing your volume of gas usage, you want to make sure that your transport rates are reflecting the usage that you're using. So that's another important piece when you're evaluating your pricing on gas that you're managing is the transport piece. Um, as far as the storage part, Embridge and, and, and Union both control that piece. Um, I put in GA mitigation here because uh, it's a future of information. You can slash this and say CHP GA mitigation because the two to me are, are equally important. Um, as I've said, GA mitigation is no longer just about peak shaving. GA mitigation has evolved into peak management. So it's managing your power. And, and if you want to be in this space, one of the things I always will say to clients, if keep in mind, $12 million billion is the pool for Ontario. If you're not mitigating, that means your piece of the pie is bigger. So keep in mind your friends and your neighbors are all mitigating that are up that size. Or if you're producing your own power, you're not, um, you're taking less of this pie. So that means there's less people to pay the, pay the piper, so to speak. 
So for clients who are not doing something about controlling these costs, they're going to pay more for GA because it's companies that aren't paying that bill, that bill's going to get paid by somebody. And if you're not doing anything to mitigate or take control of your hydro prices, you are going to pay more for global adjustment costs. Um, as I said before, the number, there's number of alerts and the length of alerts is going to increase in my opinion, mainly because the curve in Ontario is flattening. And I think that's a good thing it's flattening because it means people are doing a good job of, of mitigating their peaks. They're actually doing what the government set out to do. Um, Off-grid base load is becoming far more popular or hybrid, like I said, a combination of CA and mitigating your, your peak. Um, I just, I have to agree with John, this is going to go up and up and up. And there is going to be a point, I don't know when, but I'm sure there's going to be a point where you're going to be allowed to sell power back to the grid. And if that ever happens, then I would say, you know, putting in something you operate 724 makes a heck of a lot of sense. Um, that's when you really do get involved and think about doing that if you are able to sell power back to the grid. It's coming. When? What time will tell. I always tell clients on the mitigation side, whatever, whatever you install, make sure it's something that has the ability to be upgraded to CHP. So when we put our systems in on for mitigation with our clients, they are always just engines and things that we have the capability of running 724. We don't necessarily run them 724. We may only we usually run them only 500 hours or 250, depending on whatever it mitigates it to. But at the end of the day, we always put systems in that are upgradable to 724 type of operation. I think that's really important when you're putting in whatever system you do. Um, as we've all talked about, there's a lot, certainly other benefits of on-site generation as the CO2 is one of the big components of that. As I said before, really the reason there hasn't been as much CO2 in Ontario use is because the power prices didn't warrant us putting in systems. But now that it does warrant, the price of power does warrant putting in systems, we are going to see more CO2 being used in Ontario. It's just a natural fit for greenhouses. Um, the rising GA cost is also going to be, have an impact on Class B. I actually think CHP is going to become far more prevalent in, in this area as well, where clients of, that are smaller users are also going to start using more of it. That also means that it's also more important for anybody who's a large user to be taking control of their power because those are the people right now that are paying, you and I at our house are paying the GA right now. Then that gets back to what I talked about flexibility and this is why I'm a big supporter of generators over batteries or a combination of batteries. I, I like the hybrid systems where you use some battery with generators, I, have, I, I like that as well. But I think that system gives you a lot more flexibility to manage the government, manage whatever the government throws at us. Well, it's not something I believe is going to happen, but you never know what if the government, some government comes in and says, I'm getting rid of Class A. It happens four years from now. Well, if you have a system where it can run 724, it's not really going to be that big a deal. Because now you're looking and facing a power cost that's, you know, 14, 15 cents and up, where before you ran it maybe 500 hours a year, now you're going to run it 8,000 hours a year. Because that's the way you're able to control your power costs. If you put in a system that's not able to run all the time, it now becomes a bit of a white elephant. And that's one of the reasons I, I like the generators over, over just the straight batteries, or generator slash, slash power. The one plus to the batteries, I will say, that we obviously is the green factor. It does have a carbon, carbon component to it for where you can, you can gain carbon credits. So there is that piece, that's the one piece that does work in its favor. The good thing about generators that are running off natural gas is they don't, they are very efficient. They're still considered green friendly, which is, is one nice piece to it. As provided they have put all their emissions on. And that's the other thing we really strive with clients is make sure all your emissions are up to spec. Um, putting in something it's not, somewhere down the road, my belief is you'll end up doing it. That's it. Well, market renewal is looking for incremental capacity, and uh, it might lead to more uh, local uh, power uh, pricing. I, I never, you know, all these government programs that came out for CHP, I, I actually 
felt in the end they actually worked against the market. So from my standpoint, as far as the government ones, I'm not as, you know, a lot of them are gone now. They, they don't use, there's no program left for, for putting in CHP. But there is some on the new build side yet. So if you're building a new build, there's government programs you can take care of. Where I will actually encourage you to go is Union Gas, Enbridge, do have a lot of programs for efficiency. So I would encourage you to talk to Union Gas and some of those, con uh, or whoever your utility is, because they do have uh, money for putting in projects like this. There is some opportunities available. Um, my own personal opinion on, on, on a CHP system is that it'll sell itself on its own merits. You know, the price of power where it is today and stuff, you can put one of these systems in and justify it without worrying about the government programs and stuff. It's not to mean that I wouldn't go after them. Some of the problems with government programs though is, what we experienced with the CHP program and Save Energy, I had clients who applied for the grants. It took two and a half years to get the funding. And it held the project up for a year and a half. Well, if they'd put the thing in right away, the money they got from the funding would have been, would have been eaten up by the fact they, they if they put it in right away, they'd save more than waiting for the funding. So that's the problem with government funding as far as from my standpoint, is it just takes too long right now. If the government gets to a point where they're far more efficient with it, I'm all for it. But my, my frustration, and I, like I said, I did 150 CHPs, and if I had to do it all over again, I would have ignored the funding program. <laughs> because it just, it cost me more in the end than it did putting the engines in right away. Unfortunately, yeah, that was the case. I don't know if that answered your question, Alan, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I get the, you're, I think you're referring to the PSUI. Yes. Program, right? But this is an <laughs> upcoming future program. That I yeah, the, keep, a, keep, a, keep abreast of what's the out, coming out and stuff. There's always new things coming out. I, I just see it supportive of CHPs because they're looking for oh. supplemental capacity. And yeah, the they're. That is going to be more localized pricing. Right? So you need more supply of different loads. Yeah, there's LDCs that are actively looking to promote generation. My, I'm a little bit, this is where my farm boy comes back in, where I see a lot of companies out there with shared savings and stuff like John had talked about. Those models to me, in a lot of cases, especially with the battery programs and things, you're giving up too much of the pie. Um, that's one of the, we actually have clients looking at John's program too, and I do like it, because I, I think it's more of a, here's what you're gonna pay. And that to me makes a lot of sense. A lot of the programs where you looked at shared savings, I actually have come up with leasing models where the client gets a lot more of the, puzzle, the pie. So um, it, every program's different. Every LDC is trying to localize their, they're trying to become a generator on their own merits. So there is definitely that out there. But at the end of the day, I, I'm a big believer in you are producing your own power, you produce your own power. How you do that working with someone like a, a power purchase or something like that, you need to take control of your own of your own house, so to speak. That's me. That's my personal opinion. Maybe it's my farm boy coming out, but um, at the end of the day, I'm a big believer in that. Thanks.